Welcome back, everybody. I'm ready to jump in the Word with you in just a few moments. But before we do, I just want to say something that's really important. We are meeting in person on Sunday mornings. I know it's great to join us online. I'm thankful for you. But if you are in our area, it's time to come out of the cave. Hibernation season is over. Come on out to the gathering place, 9.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings. We're having a good time. There's fellowship. There's connection with people. It's, uh, it's a time where we're able to worship God together, get into the Word, but you need to see some people face to face. God is doing a great thing in our church, and I can't wait to see you in person. Also, coming up February 20th, Pastor Robbie Booth is going to be here doing a marriage and relationship seminar. It's Saturday from 9 to 3 o'clock. It's going to be powerful. If you want to learn some tools on how to communicate better, how to get your spouse to like you more, how to have a better relationship, uh, how to be a better person for those relationships you're in, you want to join us. You can go to our website, tgpchurch.com, to sign up. Do it right now. Welcome back, Gathering Place family. Good to be with you. Hey, last week we started talking about the believability of the Bible. And as I was doing some research, you know what I found out? Christians have a hard time believing the Bible. Now, I don't expect the world to believe the Bible. Those who don't know Jesus or really honor God or really think about Him much at all, uh, it doesn't make sense that they would just automatically believe the Bible. You don't just you know, wake up one day and say, hey, there's a book out there that I believe. But for Christians, it's, it's surprising to me how many uh, people who would claim to, to be Christians don't believe the Bible. Now, uh, I want to say this. I don't think any of us know everything that the Bible says, meaning this. Even though I've read the Bible multiple, multiple times, I don't have it memorized. I don't know everything that it says. I don't remember it all. Uh, but I believe the Bible. <laughs> there are some things that, that I may not even know, but if you show it to me from the Scripture and uh, we're able to walk through that, I think I'm going to believe that. I'm going to believe the Word of God. There's probably some things that I believe that I was just raised to you know, believe culturally, uh, maybe in church or maybe just in life, that, that if you show me the Bible, show me the Scripture, that my belief is wrong, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say, man, I never saw that, or I'm wrong, because I've got to line it up with the Scripture. And that, that's what we do as followers of Christ. Which is what a Christian is, by the way. A Christian is a follower of who? That's right, a follower of Jesus Christ. And so you would think that if we're going to follow Jesus, that we're going to follow His Word, right? My concern is there's a lot of Christians who are probably uh, Christian by culture. They're Christian by church membership. They're Christian by experience of being American. And, and God wants to take us more in that uh, deeper than that. He, he wants to really, he, he wants to know us and he wants us to know him. And so last week we talked about the believability of the Bible, the believability of the Bible. So often if you're in a conversation and you say something that the Bible says and it goes against what the culture says, what happens? They say, well, why do you believe that? Well, because the Bible says. Why do you believe the Bible? Well, Typically, we were, uh, mm, uh, well, uh, well, you know what? I, I got to go, right? We don't always have a good reason why we believe the Bible. In fact, uh, I think it's, it's really interesting. Anytime someone says, you know, well, the Bible says this or that, ask them where it says that. There are some things that we think the Bible says, like, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness. You know that scripture? Well, the Bible doesn't even say that. We got to go back to the Word. So let's, in fact... Before I open up the scripture with you, pull out your Bible, hold it up and say this. This is my Bible. It is God speaking to me. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. So I open my heart today to hear God speak a word that will change my life forever. All right, open in your Bible with me to Second Peter. And so as we talked about this, the believability of the Bible, we said uh, we used four statements. We can believe the Bible because it is a reliable collection of historical documents. 
and it was written by eyewitnesses in the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. And they report on supernatural events that were fulfillments of specific biblical prophecies. And they claim that the, their writing is not human, but rather divine in origin. Okay, those four things. And we took time last week, and I'd encourage you to go back to, to that message, and you can figure out exactly uh, in detail a little bit more about each of those points. But I want to remind you the scripture that that came out of. In Second Peter, as he's writing, he starts off in verse 16, he says, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the very first thing he said. These aren't fables that we're talking about. Remember, it's a reliable collection of historical documents. He said, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We didn't just hear these things ourselves and, and, or make them up, but we were eyewitnesses. We saw them firsthand. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So they reported on supernatural events that were fulfillments of biblical prophecies. Verse 19, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed. So they saw these things with their own eyes. They saw the miracles, the healing, the blind eyes open, the ears uh, open, the, the lame walking, the dead raised, the bread and fish uh, multiplied. They saw the demons cast out, and ultimately they saw the resurrected Jesus. Those were all prophetic things, scriptures that were uh, written beforehand that were fulfill, fulfilled in Christ. And there's so much more that has been fulfilled in Christ. And they're saying this, these are supernatural events that we're writing about that are fulfillments of specific biblical prophecies. And they claim that their writings are not human, but rather divine in origin. Verse 20, knowing this, First, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation or any private origin. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So those four things are important. And, and when we read the Scripture, we see that stuff pop out over and over. You would think that if, if you're going to come to Christ because you recognize that you are a sinner, and He is the only way of salvation. And you come to Christ, you confess that to Him. God, I am a sinner. I need salvation. I believe that you died on the cross, Jesus. You paid for my sins. Lord, please forgive me. I believe you rose from the dead. Give me a new life. God, fill me with your Spirit. Change my life. You know, if we cry out to God, and we experience that forgiveness. And I'm not just talking about, did we have a, an experience? I'm saying you're, you're going to receive forgiveness from God. You're going to receive a new life. You would think that if that's the case, it would be worth taking time to develop that relationship with Him. Because this isn't free fire insurance, folks. I know that uh, we're planning on going to heaven, but we don't just come to Jesus for a get out of hell free card, right? No, we, we give them our life and we receive new life. And so for us, it would make sense to say, okay, God, what do you say to me? What do you want to say to me? Well, I want to know you. I want to know more about you. I want to understand. I don't think you need to understand everything in here when you very first come to faith in Christ. Not at all. But I do think you should start to dig into the word. I think he calls us into that relationship. Lifeway does a study, Lifeway Ministries does a study every two years, and they just try to get a good sense of what are the beliefs of Americans and what are the beliefs of Christians in America? And what are the trends, which direction is this going? And of course, I wouldn't expect non-Christians to believe the Bible, but when we go back to Christians again, here's some of the things they found. 52% of, of Christians those who would claim, you know, those things that I just said, Jesus is the only way to heaven, uh, God created he heavens and the earth, you know, I need to be forgiven of sin, the word of God is authority in my life. 52% claim that most people are basically good, meaning you're basically good. Like, yeah, that guy over there that's in prison for, you know, running over all those people, he's bad. 
but my neighbor over there that plays piano and, and helps out, you know, in the local charities, they're pretty good. Meaning this, that they're pretty good that they'll probably go to heaven. They'll probably go to heaven because they're good. 51% uh, said God accepts the worship of all religions. All religions? So, so worshiping God in the manner of the Muslim is the same as Christianity. So worshiping God through animal sacrifice is the same as Christianity. So worshiping the, the hundreds of thousands of different Hindu gods all actually goes to the one true God that we worship. So you see Christians, now again, 51%, about 50% of Christians either don't understand who God is, they don't understand um, eternal issues, they don't understand worship, there's a lot that they're missing. Here's a, here's a big one. 78% believe that Jesus was the first and greatest being created by God the Father. Almost 8 out of 10 of those who claim to be Christians believe that Jesus was a created being. Okay. If you believe that, you probably really don't understand Christianity. You probably don't understand a whole lot. So maybe you just knew, hey, I'm a sinner and I need to be forgiven and I love God. He's got to be real. Uh, and that's where your, your understanding stopped. I am not trying to be dismissive or make fun of anybody, by the way. We have got to mature in our faith, though. In fact, if you were to uh, do a survey of all of us, there's probably a lot of areas that we've got to grow in. We've got to get it together in. So... We've got to believe the Bible. We've got to go to the Word of God. We've got to learn it. We've got to study. I tell people all the time, hey, spend time in God's Word daily. Find out what God is saying to you. That's daily devotions. Daily devotions is not the same as Bible study. So it, it's uh, putting your toes in the water of hearing from God. It's putting your toes in the water of understanding who God is, who you are, what uh, is your purpose here on earth? What are the problems in this world? What are the solutions? What's the end game look like? You know, all of that stuff that really shapes our worldview. Uh, we've got to dig into the word and, and find out what does God say about all, all of this, right? We can't just wing it and go by whatever culture's telling us or the news or whatever just seems right to us. We've got to get back into the word. I think you'd agree with that, right? Do you agree? I don't know. I agree. I think. I agree with myself. I agree. Thanks. Okay, so I want to walk through some of those things that I just uh, mentioned to you, those four things. Uh, biblical, it's a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses in the lifetime of other eyewitnesses who report on supernatural events that were fulfillments of biblical prophecies, and they claim that their writing was not human, but rather divine in origin. Okay, here's, here's where I want to start. I actually want to start backwards. The the writers of the, the scripture, they claimed we were inspired by God. Peter said it himself that no scripture came about by private interpretation or, or private origin. It came as people were moved by the Holy Spirit. That agrees with what Peter, uh, with what Paul actually, I should say, told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. From childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So the scriptures point us to salvation, which is through faith in Christ Jesus. The scriptures point us that direction. Now, someone might come and preach those scriptures to you, but the scriptures will always point you in that direction. By the way, there is not salvation in anyone else other than Christ Jesus. There are not many ways to God. There are people who are... Uh, misled by this and think, well, you know, if they're good people and they're honest and, and they, they kind of, you know, they, they, they worship God and they do the best they can, they're going to go to heaven. The scripture says that, that there is salvation in no other name but in Jesus. Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Is that exclusive? Yes. But here's the deal. It's, it's so inclusive because it's an invitation to everybody. He makes the invitation to everybody, and nobody has to jump through any hoops to get there. 
because he's done it all for them. They just simply have to hear the gospel, which is presented in scripture, and turn their hearts to Jesus, place their faith and trust in him. They don't even have to do anything. They don't have to earn it. They don't have to create, you know, do some great deeds to get there. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. He did it all. So Paul's telling Timothy this, and then he goes on to say, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture. How much scripture? All scripture. Okay. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Say it out loud. How much scripture? All scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And you know what? It's profitable. It's good for you. It's going to help you out. It's profitable for uh, doctrine, which means what? Teaching. The Word of God is important for teaching in your life. Uh, let me tell you why it's important for that. Because the Spirit says in the last days here that people are going to depart from the faith. They're, they're going to give heed to all kinds of uh, demonic doctrines. The Word of God says this to us. 1 Timothy chapter 4 now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. This is scary. <laughs> I don't want to scare you. I just think we got to read the Word right here. The Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith. What will they depart from? The faith, right? That means that at some point they were in line with the faith or they were alongside the faith they were among the faithful or among those of faith some somehow they were with now i i don't know if they ever had been fully born again and placed their tra trust in jesus christ it just says this just just what he said i didn't write it you, you can read it yourself now the spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith why will they depart from the faith? They will give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So there are those who are part of the faith who will depart from the faith because they give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Uh, most of those deceiving spirits and doctrines or teachings of demons, they don't show up like, uh, <clears throat> hello, I'm a demon and I would like to uh, shipwreck your faith today. Please follow me. We're going right this way. It's a detour. That's not how they work. They show up in ways that seem good. They tug on our heartstrings. There's sometimes they, they, they present in a way that just makes sense. You know, there are, are Christians who are struggling with their faith and, and they're doing what's called deconstructing Christianity. These are, are people who would take the Bible and, and start to read it and find reasons not to believe it because it didn't work in their life. Or maybe they, they start to say, well, it doesn't really mean that. What's happening? De uh, doctrines of demons, deceiving spirits, progressive Christianity, those who would embrace a worldview that is, that is uh, completely uh, opposite of what God would intend. And it's pervasive in the church. There are people who have loved God who are slowly giving ears to this because they're missing that divinely inspired word that is profitable to them for doctrine, for teaching and understanding, for reproof. Is this right or is this wrong? The scripture gives us the reproof of our own beliefs and actions as well, our attitudes, our character, for correction and for instruction in righteousness. The Word of God is sufficient for these things. In fact, it's everything we need for that. You don't need this and some other religion. You don't need this and some other book. You don't need this and some special knowledge that's found outside of this. You need this right here. Look at the next verse, 17. That the man of God may be thoroughly equipped uh, may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Word of God will complete you. The Word of God will thoroughly equip you for everything God's called you to. God's Word is powerful. I'll tell you why God's Word is powerful. Because God's Word isn't simply something 
that is an idea expressed by him. But God equates his word with himself. Let's look at John chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Who is the word? The word is Jesus. Isn't it interesting that God calls the word and Jesus, they're the same. The, Jesus is the word. The word is Jesus. When God says, I'm giving you my word, he says, I'm giving you my son. God and the word are inseparable. God and his word are inseparable. As faithful as God is to himself, God is faithful to his word. When we receive his word, we receive him. When we reject his word, we reject him. When we question his word, and I don't mean like, hey, I don't understand this, but hey, I don't think, I don't think it means that anymore. And I don't mean like, I'm unsure, like, I don't know if it means that. I mean, you, you know the attitude, like, like I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to believe that. I'm not going to read that. That goes so against how I feel about people. Why would God ever say that? Like, surely that's changed. That was just, that was just cultural back then. You know, when we, when we do that with the word, we do it with God. When we love his word, we love him. When we embrace his word, we embrace him. When we talk about his word in a life-giving way, we talk about him in a life-giving way. When he, we use his word to bring healing to others, you know what we're doing? We're bringing him to others. But when we use his word to condemn and to hurt others, you know what we end up doing? We're, rep we're misrepresenting him. And we're saying that Jesus is condemning you. And Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. <laughs> he came so that the world through him might be saved. That's what his word says. So God takes his word so serious. And this is why Paul is saying, saying, Timothy, you know, scripture right here, it's what you need in your life. And then he goes on, he says, go, go and preach the word. I'm, I'm telling you, preach the word, convince people, convince people. Why does he tell them to convince them? Because they don't believe it, right? Uh, he says, exhort them with all patience and teaching, because the time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. This can come through religious teaching. It could come through political uh, sociology, the humanities. It could come through your, your scientific approach. It could come through just good old-fashioned you know, common sense, this just makes sense to me. You know, it could come all those ways. People turn uh, aside to, to find, you know, these teachers who will satisfy their own desires because they have itchy ears. They won't endure sound doctrine. So, so Paul's telling Timothy, Timothy, get the word into people's hearts. And I'd say the same thing. Get the word into your heart. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, in the past God spoke in various ways through the prophets, but now he's spoken through his son. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the word of God is, is living and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces to, the, pierces to the division of the soul and the spirit, and, and um, it divides the intents and, of the heart. And so it, it's so sharp and it gets right to the very heart. It, you know, it divides from the, the soul and the spirit here. And then it goes on to say in verse 13, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all must give an account to him. So the word is living and powerful and all people will give account to him. No one's hidden from him. So the word is a he. Who is that word? It's Jesus. He, he when, when you're receiving the word and, and in the word, you know what you, you're doing? You're pressing into Jesus. You're receiving from him. This right here will keep you solid and stable in the world we live in. So you gotta, I got to ask you this question. Are you taking time in God's Word? 
do you crack open the Bible? This isn't a, hey, condemnation, it's okay if you're not. No, I'm telling you, the days we live in, it's not optional for us. It's not an option for us to just get in God's Word or not. Those days of, of being a Christian and just skating by and hearing the sermons and trying to be a good person and throwing some prayers up to God every so often, those days are behind us. We're coming into a time here where there are dividing lines and we have got to be solid in what we believe. You who have lived your faith out for many, many years and, and you've lived this way, you know what I'm talking about. And you have a concern for the next generation who are embracing all these philosophies that, that move Jesus out and put man in the center. And even if they say things like, you know, God is love, what they're really saying is, Love is God. Love is God. And so anything that shows love, it's Christian. But anything that actually says that's wrong or that God would judge that, that's not Christian. That's how they would come across. Those are deceiving spirits. And so we watch these things and, and we see it creep into the church. We see it creep in among Christians. And, and God forbid that that ever happened to you and me that we get so deceived that we, we lose faith in what God says. Because this right here is God's Word. It's true. It's believable. It has authority in our life. We've got to embrace it. It will change our life. It'll transform us. It'll set us free. This right here is, are, are the words of eternal life. Like, like Peter said to Jesus, where else will we go? You alone have the words to eternal life. That's what we're after. I'm not after the popularity or the acceptance by those around me. I'm not out for the approval of my neighbors or, you know, the most views on YouTube. I'm after God saying to me, well done, good and faithful servant. How am I going to hear those words? Well, I've got to know what he's telling me. I've got to be in the book right here, hear his word as he speaks to me. And I hope that you have that same heart and desire as well. Hey, that's all we have for today. I want to remind you, I can't wait to see you in person. Come on out of hibernation. Second, on February 20th, Pastor Robbie Booth's coming for this Marriage and Relationship Seminar. Uh, sign up at our website, tgpchurch.com. Until I see you, live out your faith more than Sunday. Bye.